All right. Hello and welcome to another sales chat. My name is John Golden from Pipeliner, uh, Pipeliner CRM and Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine. I'm here in uh, San Diego, California. My colleague Martha, as usual, is in Vienna, Austria. And we are delighted to welcome from Lisbon, Portugal, Ago Clytons. How are you doing today, Ago? I'm great, John. Thanks for having me, yeah. John, Martha. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, and I was practice director in EMEA at the Rain Group and uh, globally recognized B2B thought leader, understanding buyer perspectives, inside selling. And, and the Rain Group do a tremendous amount of, of great research and great work uh, across the globe. And uh, and I think I was even going to mention, I think there's some great uh, research coming out uh, tomorrow from the Rain Group. Before we get into the the questions, though, I just wanted to let you know that, as usual, you can join in the you can join in and interact on Twitter. the The hashtag is hashtag sales chats. That's hashtag sales chats. Martha will be monitoring the uh, the Twitter feed. So, if you have a question, or you want to answer the question, or you want to interact with the audience, just hashtag sales chats. Okay. So with that, today we want to talk about how to be a top sales performer and who doesn't want to be a top sales performer. So Ago, let's let's kick this off and say, what are what are some of the secrets that to, uh, of top performers that make them so much more successful than the rest? Well, I'll give you a I'll give you a hint. You know you know how to say a visual is worth a thousand words. Yep. So I'll give you I'll give you a hint right here. See what it says <laughs> on the cup there. <laughs> patience. <laughs> yeah, patience. Excellent. Exactly. Now, all kidding aside, yeah, sure, patience is one of them. But as you mentioned, John, um, so we at Rain Group, we, we do a lot of primary research around uh, you know, why buyers buy, um, what top performing sales organizations do, et cetera, et cetera. And so a couple of years ago, we actually set out to answer a seemingly innocent and simple question, which is why do B2B buyers buy from one firm versus another? Why do B2B buyers choose to interact with one seller versus another? And so out of that came a list of top 10 factors um, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that you've read, you've, you may have read the research and, and some of the people watching this may have, may have come across it as well. But essentially, so what we did was we, we interviewed and surveyed 703 B2B buyers. Um, and we analyzed about 3 billion in transactions. And a, a list of top 10 factors came out that buyers said, this is why I buy from firm A versus firm B. Um, so we didn't ask sellers because if you ask a bunch of intelligent, smart, driven sellers what they what makes them so wonderful, then you get all sorts of answers. Mm -hmm. And what I always say to my clients is, if you think about it, if we're honest with ourselves, who decides what to buy, how much to buy, when to buy, who to buy from, and under what terms and conditions to buy? If we're honest with ourselves, it's the buyer. And so mm -hmm. we went out and we interviewed and surveyed all these buyers, and this list of top 10 factors came out. The number one reason why buyers buy from firm A versus firm B is because the seller educated them with new ideas and perspectives. And this is pretty key, right? New ideas and perspectives. Now, um, that may sound a little bit surprising. Uh, when I ask clients, you know, why do you think people buy? The inevitable things come out like, you know, I think people buy on price or think people buy because we have great products or service or RIP or our people or our brand. Um, so sometimes people are surprised by this, by this idea of new ideas and perspectives. But if you think about it, it's pretty logical. Um, think about anything you would ever want to buy in your life, from a vacuum mm -hmm. cleaner to a high-end car or even a house. What's the first thing that we all do? What, what is the first thing that we do when we consider a purchase? Yeah, but we do some research. Yeah, we do some research and we go on the internet, we do that research. And before you know it, you can download, you know, a stack of white papers and, and, and all sorts of data sheets and decks and whatnot and comparisons and vendor comparison sheets and awards and whatnot. And the fact is this, information is abundant and cheap, right? Yeah. What's not cheap is meaning. What's yeah. not abundant is interpretation. And so buyers are looking for sellers to come in and help them build meaning, interpretation, interpretation make them uh, help them make informed choices and so the number one reason again why a buyer say this is why i buy from firm a versus firm b is because the seller educated them with new ideas and perspectives number two reason incidentally is because just before you move on to number two though it's a good point to for people who are listening to remember is that yes uh, we hear all the time about the the educated buyer the empowered buyer but as your as your point is is a very good one is we have all this information at our fingertips but then it's often paralyzing because we've got 
a bunch of research which says this product is phenomenal a bunch of research that says maybe it's not a bunch of research and and all and we don't know how to compare so the salesperson who comes in and can provide something beyond that the insight the education is is really really critical and more helpful than ever so salespeople are more important rather than less well you know what now that you said that john i'm not I'm, i'll talk about the number two factor mm -hmm. later but if you look at that list of factors, there are fully three out of 10 that relate directly to the salesperson, right? Um, mm -hmm. So buyers are saying things like in the top 10 list, buyers are saying things like, you know, I want a seller who collaborates with me. That's the number right. two factor, incidentally. Um, I want a seller who connects with me personally. I want a seller who's honest about the pitfalls and the risks that are associated with buying. Um, and so even in hardcore B2B sales, and so the people that we interviewed, you can imagine these are high-end senior executive leaders. Um, so people who are pretty hard-nosed about business, even they're saying, you know what, I want to buy from a person I like and I trust, right? Mm -hmm. So the individual seller is not, at least in high-end B2B sales, yep. is not less important. It's actually, he's actually, he or she is actually becoming more important in the sales process to give that meaning, to give that interpretation and that guidance. Um, Couple more things I want to talk about in terms of what top sellers do. Um, four, four out of 10 factors in that list relate directly to risk. So things like help me avoid uh, potential pitfalls, depicted the purchasing process accurately. Those are all related to risks. Mm -hmm. So buyers have been burnt in the past, budgets are still tight. Uh, there's still a lot of scrutiny on corporate spending and buyers are, I wouldn't say terrified, but at least concerned about making a wrong choice because a wrong choice can have all sorts of impact. Exactly. Right? And I always tell people that you've got to remember in a B2B sale that on the on the buyer side, that the purchase can be career enhancing for them if it works out. It can be career limiting if it doesn't. So there's a lot of emotion wrapped up on the buyer side. So to your point, like risk is a major factor. Absolutely. And so we, we talk about rational and emotional afflictions and aspirations, and that's exactly what you just said, right? Um, if, you, if we're honest with ourselves, again, even in a B2B setting, there's a lot of you know, personal factors that come into a buying decision, right? Do I like you? Do I trust you? Do I feel like you'll, you'll do right by me? Are you upfront and honest about these risks and what you'll do uh, when they do come up and when they do occur? Um, so, so absolutely. Um, let me talk a little bit about one thing that is not on that list, by the way. So I, I've got this list of top 10 factors and if people are interested in that, I'm sure we can get that out to them. Um, but what's not on that factor, that list of top 10 factors is, do you want to take a guess, John, what's not on that list? Uh, I don't know. You got me. Go on. All right. I'll tell you. It's price. Price is not price. on that list. Mm -hmm. The closest we come is uh, uh, is overall value is higher when compared to competitors. Value, mm -hmm. so value, mm -hmm. we talk about value, not price, and it's number 10 out of a list of top 10 factors. So right. price, um, anybody who comes to me and says, you know, Argo, I think B2B buyers, they buy on price and price alone, um, I, would, I would certainly challenge that, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so value, the concept of value, though, encompasses a lot of different things, right? You know, price encompasses one thing, it's a number, right? But value encompasses a lot of different components. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, sir. I've nothing yeah. after that. You said that really well. No, no. <laughs> okay, there you go. Um, so, um, so there's another thing. I mean, one of the things that you mentioned, and I think that we we always have to uh, to come back to again is, as you said, is salespeople, even top performing salespeople, they tend to be unconsciously competent, right? They really they have some idea maybe of how they they are successful, but often they don't really know how they're successful. That's why it's. Uh, you know, you need to look elsewhere, you know, and get the research around it. But what are, um, you know, what are, uh, what are top performing salespeople? What do they focus on more than other, uh, you know, less uh, successful salespeople? Because I think focus is a big thing. Yeah, so I, th I think the answer, I think the answer is going to surprise you a, a little bit, John, because we, um, unsurprisingly, we've done some research into that as well. Um, and so I like to think of, if you think about a successful salesperson, or if you think about behavior change or what people need to do in order to get better, because I think a lot of people that are going to be watching this video, they're going to be going, okay, what can I learn from this? What can I take away mm -hmm. from this? Right. I look at this as a, a small, like a triangle, right? Um, and the triangle, the top of the triangle is, uh, it's for me a skill set. 
So that's the basic core skill set of, of sales, right? So you need to be able to qualify deals. You need to be able to prospect. You need to be able to do a proper job. It needs discovery. You need to be able to overcome and handle objections. You need to be able to close. That's skill set. Um, the bottom part of the pyramid is mindset. Mindset is uh, essentially it's, you know, I believe there's business to be had out there. I have an optimistic attitude. As we all know, sales can be a notoriously hard profession, mm -hmm, even if sure. you've got a stellar closing rate, which is 60 to 70 percent, which most sellers don't even get come close to. But even people who, who have that closing rate, imagine they still lose one in three deals. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and many, many sellers out there, they lose more often than they actually win. And so you need to be able to bounce back from that to be resilient. So that's the mindset piece. And then the third piece is behavior. Um, and behavior is, is really about going out and consistently doing the things that lead to success. It is no, you know, it's the whole theory of uh, Malcolm Gladwell, right? The 10,000 hours. Um, you know, it's, it's about going out there and you know, it's fail, 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 and then try again and then you succeed. Um, and so what we found is that, so if people don't have the skill set, they'll say, well, I don't know how to do this. Mm -hmm. And so top performing sellers have this skill set and they have the, the core skills of a great salesperson. But that's not all. They also have the mindset. So they believe there's business to be had. They bounce back from, 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 from setbacks and, and, and failure. They wouldn't consider that failure, by the way. They would consider that learning opportunities. Um, and, and so they have the right mindset in place. But what's really most important is that they have the right behavior in place. And where that all starts and ends is with productivity. Mm -hmm. We found that by and large, top sellers, they're not massively better at stuff than other. It's not like they have this magical ability to whisper into prospects here <laughs> and make them do what they want. You know, they're not magicians. They're, you know, they're people mm -hmm. like you and me, but they go out, they go to bat, they, you know, they play more games than anybody else. And they, and they, you know, and they, and that's how they succeed. Yeah. And I think they, there's a, there's a number of really mm -hmm. important points for people to pick up on here and I'll come back to mindset in a minute, but, but the behavior thing I think is, is, absolutely critical because uh, the top salespeople that I have witnessed over the years who who really are, are exceptional is, as you said, is they do all the hard work, right? They have, they, they call plan, they research in advance, they prepare, they do, and regardless of whether, you know, and they do this for, you know, every opportunity, like they're, 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 uh, tenacious in doing it repetitively, like following a, a process. And I think that often differentiates the top salespeople from the less ones, the ones who tend to wing it a bit, maybe sort of prepare, you know, maybe forget to call, plan, do it in the lobby or whatever, or five minutes before the phone call. I think behaviors and being being um, being consistent in your behaviors is, is something that is absolutely critical and being repetitive. Yeah, absolutely. So um, actually, John, I, you know, you, you sort of mentioned this um, already. So we do a lot of we do a lot of research and actually tomorrow mm -hmm. we're publicly uh, publishing. I've already got a copy, but we're publishing publicly uh, a new white paper. It's called Beyond Compensation, uh, Three Proven Ways to Build Sales Motivation. Would you would you like me to go into that a little bit deeper? Yeah, yeah, yeah that'd be great. Traders? Yeah, absolutely. So when we did the research on productivity, um, we we looked at, well, what do highly productive sellers do differently? And I'll, I'll tell you a couple of things. So um, it's really about three habits. And the first habit is um, the first habit is sorry. The first habit is to manufacture motivation, right? Recruit your drive. Um, so we found that the what we call the extremely productive are much more likely to have written goals, right? Mm -hmm. So they have written goals and they review those on a, on a, you know, on a timely basis. I'm not gonna say that's daily, but they review those on a regular basis. 40% of the extremely productive have written goals, 12% of everybody else does. Mm -hmm. um, the extremely productive are much more likely to plan priorities and work activities on a weekly basis. Um, about half of the extremely productive do that. It's like second nature, right? Sunday morning, you sit down, you plan your week, or Monday morning, you sit down, you plan your week, and you think about, well, what are the things that I'm going to do? And then a whopping, and this is really key, three out of four, 76% of the extremely productive hold themselves accountable for what they told themselves they were going to do. Mm. The number for everybody else is half of that, 34%. So the extremely productive are much more likely to have written goals, plan their priorities and their tasks in their activities weekly and hold themselves accountable. Um, 
It doesn't stop there, right? They're also much more likely to do things like calendar their time. So they time chunk. Mm -hmm. They work on their, what we call their greatest impact activities first in the day. They practice positive self-talk. Um, when they when they identify an activity, they don't you know lounge about and procrastinate. They they do what needs to get done. They you know they uh, I think uh, Brian Tracy called this uh, eat the frog right. Um, <laughs> so you know you eat that frog. I think that's what that's what it was. Uh, I hope I didn't get that wrong, Brian. But anyway, um, so they they begin it's immediately. Not the sounds great anyway. <laughs> yeah, not it's not, well, there we go. Maybe I came up with that one then. Um, they're they're also you know they're much more likely to plan in advance. Um, how to respond, and this is key, to triggers that will derail them or impact their productivity. So they tell themselves, if this happens, here's how I will respond, right? Mm -hmm. And then finally, they're much more likely to organize their work environment and have a morning routine that helps them get off or, or that helps them take off on a productive day. So um, these are not, and by the way, this is really interesting, right? Um, these are not necessarily sales related habits. And that's yeah, why I said okay. behavior is so yeah. important, right? If you look at things like calendaring time, um, having a morning routine, putting your greatest impact activity first in the day, time chunking, refusing to be interrupted by all, sort of, all sorts of alerts and, and social media. These are habits that all of us can, can you know, yeah, can practice. Uh, Absolutely. I, I, um, I was having this discussion with somebody recently because people are always saying, oh, you know, we're so much busier than we've ever been. Like, uh, And I say, well, is that true? Is it though? Is it or is it that we're more distracted than we've ever been? Because now we have so many different things that can distract us. As you said, we've got our social media. I can go check Instagram now. Or to be honest, uh, I know I could probably access any sports game in the world on my computer if I really wanted to during the day. So I have lots of opportunity to distract myself it's the choices i make and i think that's what you're that's what you're saying here that the top performers um are organized and they make good choices about how they use their time and where their focus goes absolutely absolutely if you take that if you take that consistent focus because it's not about the one thing right it's a little it's a little bit like compound interest right mm -hmm. um you know you do it on you know you do it the first day you do it the second day and before you know it you build up a little train but if you look at that over a year or five years or 20 years of a career that makes a massive difference mm -hmm. and one of the things that i was interested in you were saying about calendaring because i always say i always say okay uh, if you went look at a top performing salesperson's calendar you will see you sure you will see their sales appointments there obviously but you will also see you will you will see time put aside for planning for those appointments Oh God! Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, and that is something that I think that um, you know less successful salespeople don't plan enough, right? They don't put aside the time. You know, they're always in in a rush. It's funny because we have this myth or this stereotype of a salesperson is like go go go, rushing around or whatever, you know, and constant motion and all of that and yet the top the top sales uh, uh, people i have witnessed over the years are actually very calm and very organized just like you said they're completely the opposite of the myth of the person like running in the door and rushing 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 they're actually very very organized very deliberate and as i said they repeat the process yeah and actually so I'll, I'll give you a little tool here uh so we talk about the four buckets of time or four mm -hmm. quadrants of time um, and it's an acronym, it's time itself, right? T-I-M-E. Uh, so the first category is what we call treasure time. So treasure time is time that um, you can spend on things like, uh, you know, just, just for yourself, the activities that you enjoy, uh, things that, that, that you hold dear, right? So I, I, always, I always think of a silly example, but I think that top sellers, yes, they do eat lunch and they do enjoy it and they don't eat it mm -hmm. at their desk. Um, so, you know, the, the first category is treasure time. Second category then is investment time. Investment time is about the stuff that is uh, important, but not urgent, right? So that's mm -hmm. really about things like long-term thinking, account planning, account development, uh, thinking about, you know, how can I, how, how can I improve myself? Um, how can I improve, you know, the functioning of, 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 of the organization or my day? The third category, the M, is mandatory. So that's the stuff that we have to do, right? Sales meetings, sales reports, expenses, uh, travel scheduling, all that stuff. Um, and then the final category is empty. Um, great salespeople always, and that's probably why they're not rushed. They always have a couple of buffers throughout the day where you know they're not. There's nothing there, 
and, and they have that empty time. And now, of course, if you think about it again, where do most salespeople spend their time? It's probably in the mandatory category, right? Mm -hmm. I always think yep. to myself, and I read this somewhere, I can't remember who said it, but if the first thing you do in your day is open your email, you're letting others dictate your, you know, your day. It, it's essentially mm -hmm. like that. You get sucked into the inbox and, 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 and off you go for a cut. And before you wake up, you know, it's like you know, a couple of hours later, right? Yeah. And, and, and so top salespeople, they don't do that. They will, they will start with investment time or they will start with um, you know, treasure time, right? And, and so they'll have these blocks in their calendar and that makes a massive difference because as we all know, um, a block of time or an activity in your calendar will shrink and or expand to the time that you allow for it. And so if you block that time, you put it first, you know, by 10 a.m. or by, by, by noon, you, you've already gotten the most important stuff done. Yeah, and I think, uh, and, you, and you hit on it another good point there about the, the, the motivation, the mindset, the, the what you fill your brain with, the self-talk, all of that, right? And it's the same point again, is that if you start your day with social media, say, right? Maybe not the greatest thing to do because maybe, you know, social media is, you know, you get to see snapshots of a, of a point in time and you can extrapolate everything around it. So maybe you see something on social media that, that makes you feel jealous or annoyed or you think, oh, that person looks like they're having a better life than I am. Is that the greatest way to start the day? Probably not. Same thing is we, with the news. You're going to find something on the news to annoy you, you know, regardless of where you sit on the political spectrum. So it's really important, when, you, especially when you're in a profession, as you said, that gets this amount of rejection, is that you have to fill, you know, start your day properly, fill your brain with as much um, positive input as you can and avoid those things that are going to derail you. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. And, and so one of the things that we looked at was um, what are, because it's, it's, you know, it's one thing to talk about these four buckets of time and stuff that can derail you. But the other thing is where do top sellers differ mostly from most of, of, of other sellers in terms of what they then actually do, right? And so I'll give you the top three here. Number one, perhaps unsurprisingly, is they hold themselves accountable. Mm -hmm. So in other words, they do what they said they would do, what they promised themselves they would do. Um, and if they don't, they hold themselves accountable. Number mm -hmm. two, they're very proactive. So they're proactive in their outreach. They're proactive in their follow up. Um, I, you know, for about 10 years, um, John, I don't know if you know this, but for about 10 years, I was on the other side of the table. I was in financial services and I bought a lot of stuff. I didn't sell um, during that time. And so I was always surprised by it, people who just simply didn't bother coming back to me. They didn't come back to my, my inquiry. They didn't come back with a proposal when I asked them to. They didn't follow up. Top sellers are very proactive. And then number three is they have very productive habits overall. I think number four, this is an interesting one. Again, nothing to do with selling. They sustain energy. What does that mean? It means things like, you know, taking regular breaks throughout the day, taking time for yourself, um, exercising in the morning or in the evening or having some kind of an exercise routine. It means eating healthy. It means drinking water. It means, you know, uh, surrounding yourself with, with what I call positive input. Right. So whether it's podcasts or audiobooks or things like that, but taking time out to maximize and to sustain your energy. So that's, you know, just a couple of things that mm -hmm. not only that top sellers do, but where they're most they're, where that's where the biggest gap is between top sellers and, and, and what we, you know, and the other the rest, as we call them. And, and I think the energy point is a, is an, is a, a, is a critical one also, because th you think about it as it, putting your buyer hat back on again, think about it. If somebody calls you up or turns up for a meeting to sell you something and they're, they're frazzled and they're low energy and they just seem like, you know, they're, they're, they just don't seem that excited. I mean, why are you going to buy from someone like that? You're not. When somebody turns, when you give somebody the time to present their product or service to you, you you want them to be excited about it, right? You want them to be energetic. You want them to be engaged, right? Because otherwise, then you question, well, do they really believe in this product? Well, yeah. I mean, it's the old saying, right? People buy emotionally, but justify rationally. And then mm -hmm. what is it? 92% of, of language is not the words coming out of your mouth. Mm -hmm. it's, it's body language and it's the, you know, the, the tone and vibration of your voice. People pick up on your passion, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of my clients that say, you know, I'm passionate about sales and it really shows. And I am passionate about sales. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason I'm, it's not the reason I am, but the, you know, the reason because I, I can be passionate because I do, I do, obviously. I mean, I try to practice as much of this stuff as possible, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So maintaining, sustaining energy, you know, that's, that's absolutely key. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, Argo, we have a couple of minutes left uh, of this uh, broadcast. Um, what we always like to ask our guests is uh, is also to give your power tip, right? So, what is it? You talked about you know getting off to a good start every day. What what do you personally do every day to set yourself up for success? All right. Well, I'll uh, I'll tell you that very happily. So. Um, for the last couple of years, I had a morning routine, um, and this this happens way before I, I entered the office, right? But I've had a morning routine, so I start up by, and I, I'm an early riser, so depending on the day, I'll, I'll rise at, you know, I know for some folks that's not that early, but keep in mind I'm European people. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll wake up anytime between, you know, sort of 5.30 and 6. Um, and then I'll meditate first. That's there. There's absolutely that's unconditional. I will meditate for about 15 minutes. Um, after that, I will typically um, read a little bit. So it can be a short chapter or something like that. Um, after that, I will journal. Typically, it'll be about what I read and so my thoughts on that. And then after that, I'll do some kind of exercise. Sometimes it's some kind of high impact training. Sometimes it's yoga. It's something like that. Um, and so by the time that I hit the shower, I feel clear headed, refreshed. I'm awake. I'm full of energy. Um, after that, it's you know, and then that's how I start my day. How I start my work day is always I, I look at my calendar, and I always, always, always start with my greatest impact activity. Um, unsurprisingly, I, I time chunk. I put time blocks in. Um, I never, by the way, here's a power tip. You asked me for a power tip. Yep. I, 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 I'm sorry. I know this is going to sound like blasphemy to some folks, but I check, <laughs> I check my email three times a day and I respond to email twice a day. I've got two mm -hmm. blocks of half an hour a day. And the reason I did that is because for the last couple of years, I've been tracking my time using a, a time tracking app. And I found out I was spending this inordinate amount of time. It was like two and a half hours a day on email. It was crazy. Wow. And again, every activity expands and or shrinks to the time allowed for it. So I just won by just chunking that into, and I'm not going to say, you know, sometimes time doesn't get away from me, but I really try to limit email to two half hour blocks a day. Um, and, and I check email twice a day. So, mm -hmm. yeah, just a couple those, of thoughts. Those are great. And I think, it, and it really reinforces what you've been talking about through this whole, um, through this whole uh, session, uh, Argo, is, is taking control of your day, your job, your activities, rather than, as you said earlier, it's if you open your email immediately, you're letting, you're, you're outsourcing your day to everybody else, right? Instead of taking control of it yourself. So I think those are, those are fantastic points. And I like that idea. And I think time tracking is probably something it'd be good for a lot of people to just experiment in because they might be surprised. Um, I know my oh, son did this. My son the other day showed me on where on Instagram it'll give you your average amount of time you spend on it per day, you know. So it's, uh, and I think you probably all your other social media apps and everything probably can give you the same information. So that's probably a good place to start. Um, before we go, Argo, uh, do you want to tell people a little bit more about yourself, about the Rain Group, about where they can find out more about this fantastic research that you guys are always doing? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. I'd love to. So um, if you're interested in research, whether it's the research on what sales winners do differently or the research on uh, productivity that I just mentioned, just go to rainsalestraining.com and there um, there's a download section. You can you can find all the research there. Um, so, yeah, I think that's that's probably the best way if you want to. Um, connect on LinkedIn or connect on Twitter um, or on YouTube. I have a, a YouTube channel with some short um, I'd say succinct three to five minute videos on sales. I'd uh, be very happy to connect with you there. And if you have any questions, do let me know. Excellent. So my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And Martha in Vienna, did good, good activity on the Twitter chat today? That's fine, yeah. Yeah, excellent. All right. Well, listen, thank you from San Diego, from Vienna and from Lisbon, Portugal. And we'll see you all again for another sales chat really soon. All right. Thank you, John. Thank you, Martha. Thanks, everyone. Bye.